wisdom without God. We are not to seek wisdom that is only focused on life on earth, but wisdom that prepares us for eternal life and heavenly rewards. Here now is Gene Getz. Now we know that God honored Solomon's prayer. Not just for wisdom, because of his humility, but he gave him riches, he gave him honor. And all this wisdom came from God, no question. God gave him this wisdom. But he eventually used this wisdom in an earthly way, which led him then from joy to despair. And so we have Solomon's thoughts in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Then I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man be like who comes after the king? He's worried about his successor. You see? He will do what has already been done, which indicates that his satisfaction is in his own status and what he's achieved. And I realized that there is an advantage to wisdom over folly. Yes, I saw that. I could understand that, like the advantage of light over darkness. I could see that contrast. The wise man has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. I can understand that, he said, but yet, and here's the, the key word, yet, but yet, I also knew that one fate comes to them both. So I said to myself, what happens to the fool will also happen to me. In other words, I have wisdom, the fool doesn't, but we're both headed in the same direction. Death. Why then have I been overly wise? Why have I done all this? Because I'm going to end up the same place as the fool. That's not very wise thinking, by the way. It shows that we can be very earthly wise <laughs> and even use that wisdom for good and still draw some very pathetic conclusions in relationship to life. And I said to myself that this also is futile. And now he states clearly his despair. So I began to give myself over to despair concerning all my work I had labored at under the sun. In other words, he looked out at all of these things, the parks and the reservoirs and the houses and the accumulation. And he said, doesn't amount to anything. And so he came to a very immature conclusion. He said, here's what I concluded. There's nothing better for man than to eat, to drink, and to enjoy his work. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Pretty sad philosophy of life. Pretty sad conclusion for a man who had all that wisdom. I have seen that even this is from God's hand. Yes, I recognize this. He had an element of truth. He knew God was involved in the situation. How could he forget that? He prayed to God. God gave him wisdom. God gave him those things he didn't even ask for. Because who can eat and who can enjoy life apart from him? In other words, God exists. God is there. But, he said, it's all futile. Nothing better for man than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. And he's headed in the wrong direction. He's headed, in a sense, in the right direction, but he's also headed in the wrong direction. But in his heading towards acknowledging God, he never came to the place where he was really thinking beyond this earth and what lies beyond. It's all here now. So you see, even though Solomon believed that God was involved in his life, he had this very narrow, limited, earthly perspective. Rather than turning to God with all of his heart, he continued to flounder. And so he concluded, "There's all there is to life is to eat, drink, and enjoy your work. That's an earthly perspective. Now, later, again, we have the whole story and particularly the words of Jesus and I love this, and I'm sure that I know that Jesus and His omniscience 
could think of all of these events, including Solomon. And Jesus said there in the Sermon on the Mount, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things will be provided for you. In a sense, Solomon reversed that. He's focusing on all these things which in turn in his mind and experience was futile. Everything is futile. And it's a sad way to end life. So here is the question for reflection response and it is why is it so easy for even Christians to pursue earthly wisdom that generates the works of the flesh rather than the fruit of the Spirit? Well the fact is that um, there is pleasure in sin for a season. <laughs> Even Moses acknowledged that. And he had, had to make a choice, we read in Hebrews, to give up the pleasures for a season to experience eternal rewards and eternal pleasure even in this life. Jesus, of course, used an incredible illustration that relates to the unsaved when he talked about the rich fool, you know, who built his barns and his fields were productive and and then all of a sudden it all collapsed. And Jesus said, where is His reward? It's all earthly, it's gone. So Jesus was speaking, obviously, to those who do not put their faith in Him and faith in God. But it also applies to Christians because when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, remember, he said there's only one foundation upon which we should build our lives, our work, our ministry. And he's speaking particularly to spiritual leaders. And he said, what we're supposed to do is to build on the foundation of Jesus and it will be, uh, if it's for His glory, it will be like precious stones and gold and silver, but if we build it for ourselves, it will be wood, hay, and stubble. We'll be saved, but though as by fire. In other words, it's all gone as far as any works that God will honor even as a believer when we reach that eternal destination that God has planned for us. So here's the principle again that comes out of uh, the life of Solomon. We're not to seek wisdom that is only focused on life on earth. See that's what Solomon did ultimately. But wisdom that prepares us for eternal life and heavenly rewards. Again, this is what Jesus meant. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well.